Okay. Now, Carissa <coughs> is the Media and Communications Manager for both Clubs New South Wales and Clubs Australia. And as such, she handles both proactive and reactive media issues across a range of areas. These include club facilities, community support, problem gambling, poker machine tax, alcohol and smoking. She provides support and guidance, listen to this, to the state's 1,400 clubs. So I say to you, if anyone knows that staying mum is not an option, Carissa Simons does. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Carissa.
pay back to South and we send the bridge in for the It's also important to remember that different media do want different things. Newspapers about facts, about figures, about new things. TV is going to be more interested in the vision. So just going to that two to three key messages or key phrases that some of your story, this is what you want people to take away from your story. So we'll discuss the interview technique later on. If you're doing a media story, it's important to have a think about two or three key phrases you want to hear yourself saying or read yourself being quoted as in the paper. Um, they can't sound like uh, infomercials, you know, those ads that come on at midnight and someone says is talking about how wonderful this ad machine product is and how it changed their life in 30 days or less. It needs to sound realistic, it needs to sound like a human being or a robot. But, you know, a good key message is about 10 seconds long, about 30 words, and it gets a point across clearly, quickly and precisely. It's also good, apart from when you're doing positive media or proactive media, to have key messages about your club. Is your club focused on being family friendly? If your part of your strategic aim is to get more young families into your club, think about key messages that are focused on you know, young mothers, on being family friendly, on being safe community venues. You should also have key messages for, I guess, the, the three things: smoking, gambling, and alcohol. So that whenever someone comes to you and says, well, you know, our club's just sort of living off misery from gamblers, you have an answer right away. So now that I've sort of gone through that, I want to give you some actual examples of, of what this actually means. Uh, this is a great example of quirky. I uh, story we did last week. A club out in Western Sydney has a goat. I don't know what possessed them to get a goat, but they have a goat, and that is quirky because they're the first club that I've ever heard of that decided to get a goat. They also have guinea pigs, rabbits, and chickens, and a whole community garden. And the goat is quirky. The goat is the quirky hook for that story. But there are also numbers in there, how much they spent to create this community. There's the angle there of it being attractive, the key message that they wanted to create a family friendly space where the kids and parents could spend time together, where kids could learn about nature. And of course, there's great photos. Everyone loves a good photo opportunity, and that photo shoot took three hours, so maybe you should avoid working with animals and children, especially at one time. I've got to try to use a little camera shine, so I was trying to get up before I'm half old. Um, but it came up beautifully in the end. And this is a good example of how like, working doesn't have to cost a lot of money. You don't need to spend a lot of money. It doesn't have to be about, we don't, Anthony mentioned this morning um, about Woolworths, which I think is called Countdown here. Um, spending $1 million and $20 million more on advertising. You don't need to be spending which it doesn't have money to get a good positive story up. Or just get a story up that says we are a family friendly thing you create in community spaces for our local community. I mean, the goat is pretty cheap actually. Um, that doesn't mean you need to get going. They do have ongoing costs. But you can, if you're doing something quirky, I was reading a story last week um, in an Australian magazine about a New Zealand man who started a uh, pretty burly bloke who started a works for knit club. For example, if that guy started that works for knit club in your club or did a works for knit session at your club, that's a story because it's quirky and you could work in the message there that, that clubs are female friendly as well. Or at least in knitting club. Here's a, another one, which uh, basically the, this story is about changing the perception of club food, <coughs> saying that we have great food, that it's not just snitch on the state. Um, it has a strong key message there in that club food is improved. It has a good picture. Um, and these, this is a family who could be members of the club, but the club found. They, you know, I said, look, you've got a family who can come in for a photo and say some nice words about it. And they found this family, regulars at the club, a cute little kid. And that's, that's your third party endorsement right there. I mean, I think he's actually quoted as saying, oh, we tied it into why now, because it was five years on from the smoking ban. Since the smoking ban, clubs have focused so much more on food and it's paying off. So you've got your numbers, you've got your why now, you've got your third party endorsement, you've got your photo off, and you've got the quirkiness for changing the, the view around club food. This is another one which does rely on quirky a lot. It's a club who supported a rugby union team uh, in Maryland um, by also assisting them to get uh, a lot of them didn't have any sort of left before the year 12 high school certificate and help them get into TAFE, into IT courses through TAFE. And you know, it's a bunch of rugby union people 
getting on laptops and forty grand. It's quirky, it's a great story. And you know, that's what that's what the media is more and more interested in positive stories. They want quirky. You can also piggyback. So for local media, that would be uh, doing a local example of a national story. Today we talk about uh, women in clubs earlier. Um, so for example, if uh, clubs in New Zealand issue a, issue a media release about the a rise in female club membership, and your female club membership, say they said it was risen by 10%, and your female club membership had actually been by 20%, there's no reason why you can't contact your local paper, but send them what clubs in New Zealand has done and said, actually, we're doing better than the national average. And here's why. So this is a, a less positive example of this. Obviously, uh, probably know we were a bit of a bit of staff with our federal government a while ago, our former federal government. So we ran examples of national stories like this, which talked about the industry as a whole. But one of the most effective things that local clubs did, that we helped them do, was to do the local version of that story. So there you have Anthony Ward, Executive Director of Clubs Australia, saying this will hurt the industry. And then when someone opens their local paper, and people trust their local paper, they really, really do. They've got their local club that's down the street saying it will hurt us too. So you have a story, it's quirky, it has facts and figures, maybe it has a goat, it's new. But you also <coughs> have to think about different angles. With that goat story, it's not just enough to say more bank sports has a goat now, how awesome is that? You have to say more bank sports has a goat because they want to create a family friendly venue. So an angle is essentially the approach you can take on the facts or information and the way you arrange or package that information for different media to reach you know, different targets, so it's the goats, you, you know, wanted to reach uh, the you know, Western Sydney young towns, um, and the way, you know, so who you're targeting and how to generate maximum media coverage from that. So every story has more than one approach or angle. So in order to find that angle, you should ask yourself, what does this mean for? How will it impact on? So ask yourself how it will impact on middle class families, how will it impact on local businesses, what does this mean for our local sporting groups? and ask yourself what type of different media outlets will be interested in that angle. So, the easiest way I think to explain how to find, you know, how much difference an angle can make to a story is by this. Newspapers do not want to write about assaults going down in and around markets and premises. It's not a particularly interesting story for them, even though it's the truth and apparently uh, newspapers are so really good as it is. They have gone down in, in New South Wales, for example. They're at their lowest level since we started collecting the stats. Um, so we did this story. We said clubs, assaults in and around licensed clubs are at record lows. Why? Because we banned swearing. That might have stretched the truth a bit, but we banned clubs that technically had banned swearing. Um, <coughs> and then that story goes on to then say, and it's not just over flats across the state, assaults are down. Six months later, we did the same story with updated stats that said uh, clubs are, you know, safety, the safety record of clubs is at a record high because we've banned the mop and top. I don't know if mop and top is a phrase here. Yeah, but, yeah good. I uh, was lucky enough to come across a club that actually had a nice graphic of what was allowed um, and in decent exposure was a picture of a mop and top. Um, so, you know, how can you have been kicked out of these clubs with mop and tops? And the tough new regulations will not just cut them down on fashion crimes, it's also dramatically fallen under the noisa standard of dress code. So that's the same story, it's the same stats, but what the angle is, is the why. What makes it interesting? And look, in this case, the angle also adds the quirk. So moving on to interviews, because if you are you know, successful in getting your local paper to write a story, they may well want to come and interview you. Um, it, the four key rules for interviews are be prepared to have the right attitude, to keep control, and to remember the tone of body language. So, I'm going to talk about you know, preparation. When you listen to the radio, the people who sound like that they're doing, they're the most experienced and professional, professional interviewees, are the ones who do prepare the most. They appear to be answering all the stuff, but they have that all prepared. A lot of politicians do sound really scripted, but the ones who are really good are the ones who sound like they're just having a yarn with their man. For radio or phone interviews, you can have your key stats, your key messages, and numbers right in front of you. You need to go through that all before and get your key messages so that they're right at the front of your head. You've got to have the right attitude as well. Um, a lot of people think dealing with the media is scary. Sometimes it can be, it's a real issue. But you know, if you go into something, into media, you're thinking that you won't do well or 
you don't know the answers, you know, then, then you probably will stuff up. Um, it's an opportunity, you've got to think this is an opportunity to sell your club. You know, it's a free way to sell your club to the community, to politicians, and to potential new members. And you know your club better than you need to go. You've got to keep control as well. So you need to get your message across. So this is why it's important to know your key messages about your club beforehand. Because you need to get those key messages across, regardless of what the journalist's questions are. You know, you're a spokesperson for your club, you're not an answer person for the journalist. Remember tone and body language. Don't be a deer in the headlights, um, but it is good to use your know, voice and expression. If you, you know, if you don't feel excited, if you don't sound, take a radio team, if you don't sound excited about your club, you'll be going, oh well Sally, it's really uh, exciting what we've been doing with the uh, sporting group that we've been supporting, we're really proud of her. If you don't sound excited about your club, why should anyone else? You've got to sound passionate. So the one that people have most, uh, seem to have most trouble there is the keeping control and being a spokesperson, not an ass person. So knowing how to keep control is probably the most important thing, especially when it comes to dealing with things like misconceptions about the industry or your club, uh, whether it's positive or negative, or for handling hostile interviews. So it's always important not to repeat the negative in a question. So, and then to, to peel it back to your positive messages. So I mentioned earlier having key messages, not just about your club, but also around those three things. So take down for example. If someone asks you, how do, how do you respond to critics that say your club survives and is a problem gamblers? You respond by saying, I gladly respond by saying that we have seen the rate of problem gambling hard over the past decade and the work and initiatives put in place by clubs has been a cause of that. The fact is the vast majority of people enjoy playing trophies and do so successfully. You could then go and talk about what kind of minimisation measures you have in place. You don't ever answer that question going, well, no, we don't respond. Survival and misery and problem gamblers. You say, I would gladly respond, or another transition phrase to immediately move back on to your positive message about that. And depending on the, you know, some of the other sort of transitional phrases you can use, um, the factory question highlights that. In fact, few issues are given more important than it's clearly not a yes or no issue, but what I can say is. Some other interview tips, if in doubt, leave it out, don't ever lie, it is not worth it. Um, never respond to hearsay or hypothetical questions. Try and make your important points first, get your message up top before, um, you know, working as a government advisor in the Club New South Wales, I was uh, a radio journalist before that was in print. But especially in radio, when I did a, say, five minute interview, journalists are really time for, and they've gotten time, more time for since I, I left the industry. Um, I would very rarely ever go through all that sort of five minutes of interview. I never really wanted to play back my recording past the sort of first two minute mark, because once I found my grab, I had to cut it up, I had to put it in the player, I had to write the story around it. So you want to get what you, the most important stuff that you want to say right at the top. Because if you don't, then I'm probably just going to take some of the stuff you said at the top of the interview, and if you leave your best stuff to the last question, it's probably never going to be, you know, never going to see the light of day. There's no such thing as off the record. <coughs> Don't say no comment. Uh, journalists will usually write that as uh, Joe Bloggs has refused to comment on allegations that, which looks, makes it look like you're repeating it. Um, instead of saying, I'll have a look in that, into that and, and come back to you, or if appropriate, you can say well, that's actually a question better directed to possible dealings or to your counsel or relevant body. Don't give guarantees. So the example of this is, can, can you guarantee there will never be an alcohol-related assault on your friends? If you say yes, you may not have had one for 30 years, but if you say yes, I must guarantee you next week you will. Or they just send journalists in there to try and find, you know, get that shot. And instead, so you instead use that transitional phrase. So what I can say is that we are one of our safety record is proud of that and we want to strive to keep it that way. And finally, it's not personal. You can do many positive interviews if you're paid for a lot of media, um, but you know, one out of it, if, if you're really active in that relationship, still probably one to be ten times you're going to be a negative one. It's not personal. You know, the bad news, journalists have a view, editors have a view that bad news sells papers. Um, so, you know, part of
are doing positive proactive media is to fight against that. Uh, but you know, it's going to happen, and don't, there's no point cutting, going, well, there's one bad story, and I've put that nine good ones. We're going to cut off all communication. <coughs> but none of this works, and you can't do any of that unless you can communicate within your club. So, clubs need to make sure there is a good stream of communication with the committee and with the manager and staff, and, and that's the only way you can, you can communicate with club members, potential club members, and the wider community. In terms of communication between management and communities, you need open, honest and transparent communication. There's a bit of a global move towards uh, separation of governance and management, but any organisation, and that includes clubs, can only operate with honest, open cooperation between governance and management. Um, and that seems to be best practice. Uh, to help make that happen, the manager and chair need to work together to establish the agenda for the monthly committee meetings so that, you know, Regular, uh, there are regular meetings discussing issues that are of interest to both committees <coughs> and to management. It can help to get the club manager involved in the strategic planning process if they're not, and if that vision, you know, that sets the, the vision for the club five years ahead. And then ultimately, it's ultimately the management will be the ones in charge of, of delivering that. And then they will take that, turn it into an operational plan, bring it back to the committee, and, and to, for approval and including the forecast to budget. And then it's up to the committee then to monitor the cost progress against that operational plan and budget. And so, some clubs like to almost appoint a member of the committee to specific, have specific responsibilities in terms of monitoring that. So you might have a committee member specifically in charge of monitoring that, how that operational plan is pounding out in terms of work, health and safety or remuneration. In terms of communicating with staff, um, there's a whole way of ground ways to do this, and it depends on the size of your club, the number of staff you have. But if you're not doing these things, uh, or some of these things, they're definitely worth considering the way to improve communication. Um, some, you can be as simple as just staff meetings in the lunchroom, uh, to more complex like shift meetings where you have a handover of information from one shift to the next. Uh, functional group meetings where information is passed on with key functional areas like food, bar, gaming, HR, maintenance, so forth and roster meetings where everyone rostered on at a particular time of day meets and hears the information prior to beginning um, their shift. Other things to consider are staff newsletters um, and email communications, social or semi-social occasions for staff and management to get to know each other better, and team building exercises where senior management and possibly the committee joining too. Um, Clubs New South Wales does practice what uh, I'm preaching, there's actually a whole state happening on the top of the staff today. Um, I'm probably glad that I'm here and not there because anything involving hand eye coordination and all sorts, I've never done particularly well at. <laughs> and by communication with members. The key is to talk to members and find out what they want from their club, what they want to know from you. And then for you to decide you know, what method of communication is needed and what information should be given to the members and when it should be publicised. So you talking to talk to your members. And the feedback by management um, to the board, get your staff to talk to members about what they want to hear. Um, and this should help you develop a coherent, effective way to communicate with your members so that <coughs> the members can get to know what's going on, what they feel involved. This would be a club newsletter, email communications, although I would say try and limit these. You, you don't want to be sending them an email every single day. Um, you don't want to start spamming them, but having an email blast where important information goes out to your membership email list is really useful. It's kind of like a back phone, you know, or the red phone that the United States President has. You know, that sends a message to your, you know, your members, we need to get this information to you now. Um, public meetings, so when announcing major news, meet the manager sessions, meet the president sessions, and local newspaper advertisements, and of course, website, Facebook, and Twitter pages. I'm speaking of, uh, I'll also say that it's important for the stakeholders, um, for uh, members to have access to information like annual reports and to make those easily available. You can open an account at once when you get someone who really, really enjoys going through accounting figures. Um, I don't understand them, but they do exist. But it is better to be open and honest um, with that information. 
and frighten you all. Well. Um, and so here are a few things that you should keep in mind when looking at entering this world of social media. I would recommend starting with one platform first, first, either Facebook or Twitter. Don't open up Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and everything else. You'll just spread yourself too thin and won't be able to do a good job of anything. So think about who is your audience, and on that I would recommend either Facebook or Twitter. Um, who is your audience and why should they connect with you? Are you wanting to talk to members? Are you talking to potential members? Are you talking to like politicians and council? Um, if it's the latter, politicians, council, local media, and you're not really talking to your members there, then you know Twitter's probably a good way to go. If you want to be talking to your members and getting them involved in a, essentially an online club community, then you probably want something like Facebook where they can type the page. You need to think about what resources you can realistically devote to social media. Social media is not nine to five, five days a week. It is constant. Um, I have one or two Twitter pages and a Facebook page. Um, you need to be on top of it. Because people might post a question if you don't on a Saturday. If you don't get back to them till Monday, they're going to kind of think you don't care. Someone might ask on a Saturday what's going on in the field club tonight. And if you wait till Sunday, well, it's, it's too late. Um, alternately, on the more negative case, you might have someone post something defamatory on your page, and you need to take action against that very quickly. Um, the dangers of social media, open-ended questions can lead to disaster. There's, you only have to Google social media disasters and miscuts to see a long list of companies. Um, Qantas um, has a great one where they, when they grounded their fleet, on the same day they grounded their fleet as part of the industrial dispute with the union, um, they posted a Twitter comment saying, tell us what your idea of hashtag Qantas luxury is. Uh, it pretty much led to thousands and thousands of tweets from people who would agree with the union's point of view, um, you know, sort of going, my idea of conscious luxury is properly maintained planes. We're an actual flying fleet. You know, don't think about what you're posting. But being, at the same time, being boring means that, you know, why is anyone going to follow your page or be involved in that community if there's nothing interesting happening there? And um, people take them over your Facebook page when you're not looking. So how the social, um, <coughs> to be consistent, so to post 10 times one day and then nothing for a month. Um, it's home on social media, it's very light-hearted, sometimes kind of cheap, so don't be too serious, it's not a board report. Um, you know, keep a consistent tone, don't write an essay, they should be short, sharp, um, if it's too long, people won't read it. Uh, be responsive to all kinds of comments and feedback, um, you know, don't just delete negative things, unless it is defamatory or, you know, beyond the pale. Um, and if there are issues, you can ask them for their details and you can try and take it offline. But, you know, thank them for the feedback. Uh, and if you do delete comments, it's just going to infuriate the person further and, and they'll just post more negative things. It's also important to have a social media policy for your employees as well. Um, this is sort of separate stuff, but if they say in one post that they work at X club and then in a letter post say something that's uh, racially offensive or social about someone against a member at that club, it's not hard to make the connection. And there have been cases where club managers have been called by the media going, do you know that your employee is saying, I'm not going to repeat the comment, um, but say these things on social media, and what do you think about that? Is, you know, is that something that this club supports or is okay with? So having that social media policy is very important to them because if it's not going in place, then there's nothing that you can do to <coughs> your employee. Um, and finally, social media is accessible to everyone. So unless you want it on the front page, of, if, unless you would be happy to see it on the front page of the Museum and Herald, don't post it. So what to do first? Just establish links with your local media. Make a contact list, emails, phone numbers, call them. <coughs> if your club has a particular focus on a topic, like a sport or environmental initiative, um, you know, make your contact list for those outlets as well, because they may be interested in publishing stories about you. Think about a story list for your clubs. Every club has certain events throughout the year. And by pre-planning them, if you're doing, um, if you know you're going to participate in a certain charity event, like World's Great Shape, think about what angle, how you can make it quirky, how you can set up a photo <coughs> of your local paper, you know, in advance. So if you know that's coming up in, in your, you know, sort of year-long planning, then you have time to think about how to make that quirky as opposed to realising the day, two days before, <coughs> oh, like this would make a good story, what do we do? Review how your club runs its internal comms and your comms with members. So the first starting point for changing any of that. See how you're currently communicating with them. And then get feedback from members and from staff on ways that can be improved. And finally, 
I meet lots of sales staff are always there to provide guidance and advice, and I should definitely tap into that resource as well. Thank you very much.